Hopefully you had a chance to grab a bulletin on your way in. They're on the table in the foyer if you, uh, if you didn't. And uh, let me just direct your attention to the back. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements uh, of some things that are uh, going on. Um, first, uh, we are um, in the midst of uh, updating our directory. Um, and so if you have changes uh, to that, to any of your own information, um, then really today is the last day. If you could email the office um, uh, by, uh, by today, and then that way this week uh, uh, we'll be able to make all the changes and kind of get that, uh, that republished. So uh, that's the uh, um, update of our directory. Um, second, now this doesn't apply to everyone, but I want everyone to, to know that stuff like this is happening. Uh, our young adult men, um, and so if really we're talking about college age, early uh, career kind of age uh, guys, uh, got together a couple weeks ago. They're going to get together again on um, this Thursday, uh, July 13th, here at the church, just for a time of fellowship, uh, Bible study, play some games, uh, and hang out. So, um, so be in prayer for them. And if you have any questions about that, uh, you can contact Matt Duffy. Um, he's going to be uh, coordinating that. Um, and third, speaking of, uh, of Matt Duffy, um, Sunday, August 6th, will be his last Sunday with us for his uh, short uh, internship that he is doing uh, this summer. Uh, and then he heads off to start doing some schoolwork in preparation for the, uh, the upcoming semester at Reformed Seminary. Um, but on the evening of August the 6th at 6.30, uh, we want to have a, uh, an informal but a special little uh, service here with some uh, fellowship time and uh, some snacks built in at the, at the end. But we'll, we'll sing a couple of hymns, and Matt is going to give to us sort of a little mini sermon, a little devotional sermon that he is uh, preparing that will sort of uh, culminate and be the capstone of his uh, time with us. So I hope you'll mark that on your calendar for Sunday evening, August 6th at 6.30. It'll just be a good midsummer time for us to fellowship on a, on a Sunday evening together as a, as a family. There's a couple of other things listed there that we'll be uh, talking more about in the coming weeks, but those are the things to keep in front of you uh, right now. Um, and then if you open up to the inside of the bulletin, that's where our worship service is. Uh, this is where we outline the things that, that, that happen during our service. It's a um, it's a, uh, something for you to be able to use and kind of follow along. Our intent is not to make uh, anything that happens here a surprise. Um, but what we do when we come together in God's presence is we reflect on what He's done for us and we offer back to Him uh, the appropriate praise that is due to Him uh, because of who He is and because of what He's done. And so we do that uh, through the reading of God's Word. We do that through prayer. We do that through singing. We do that through the hearing of God's Word taught. Um, it's not complicated, but it is absolutely critical to understand the beauty of what this time represents for God's people as we gather together. So to start, uh, let me invite you to just take a moment um, and silently come before God. Silently ask Him to be at work among us this morning, at work in your own heart, uh, but also because you did not gather alone, you're not here by yourself, also pray uh, for those that are around you, that God will be at work in each of us as we gather to worship Him. Psalm 145, verses 10 and 13 are our call to worship this morning. And this is what the Word of God says. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all His words and kind in all His works. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we praise you for you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love for your people. You are good to all and your compassion is over all that you have made. You're faithful in all your words and gracious in all your deeds. You uphold 
befalling. You raise up those who are bowed down, and you invite the weary and the burdened to come to you. For you're gentle and you're humble in heart, and in you we will find the rest for which our souls long. So be with us, Lord, as we worship this morning, that all we say and do would be pleasing to you, because we come to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. This beautiful hymn of the faith that we will sing invites us to join into a chorus of worship, a chorus of worship with Christians throughout the centuries who are united with the heavenly creatures at the very throne of God who cry out, the scripture tells us, night and day, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and who is and who is to come. Let's stand and sing. take your order of worship or look at the screen behind me, and we're going to look at three questions from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a statement of what the Bible teaches that was developed by the church a number of years ago and and forms our standard of doctrine for this church. Now, last week we looked at one of these three questions, the last one, uh, talking about how Jesus executes the office of a king. And I mentioned then that uh, Jesus perfectly fulfills all three of the Old Testament offices of prophet, priest, and king. And in today's scripture text from Micah 3 that we'll look at, we're going to talk about that a little bit more because each of those offices are actually referenced in that text. So I thought it was appropriate for us to go back to the Shorter Catechism and to look at all three of these questions and show how Jesus executes the office of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king. So I will ask the question and in each case invite you to respond with the answer that is printed there. So first, how does Christ execute the office of a prophet? 
Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us by His Word and Spirit the will of God for our salvation. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executes the office of a priest in His once offering up of Himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God, and in making continual intercession for us. And how does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to Himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all His and our enemies. This next song that we're going to sing is a beautiful compliment to the first song that we sang, because the holy, mighty God that exists in three persons in blessed Trinity shows to us His mercy by saving and preserving His children, purchasing our salvation at such a cost. He will hold us fast. Let's stand and sing.
seated. Let me invite our ushers to come forward as we receive our offering. Our offering is our opportunity to respond to God's gracious love to us by giving back to Him towards the work of His church. He commands us to give, but it is a command that is with a promise, a promise that, means, that, that says to us that we get to participate in what He is doing in proclaiming this message of Jesus to all the world. So let's pray and let's ask that as we give, God will bless us and glorify the work of His church. Father, we thank You for the gift that You have shown us in Jesus, uh, for His sacrifice on our behalf, for the promise that that means that You will hold those whom You have saved fast to Yourself, that You have shown and proven Your love for us so much through the work of Jesus. And so, Lord, as we give back to the work of Your church with just a small portion of what You've provided for us, we pray, Lord, that You would make our hearts uh, joyful in our giving that you would use our gifts to support the work of this local congregation and local ministries and missionaries around the world, that the message of Jesus would go forth, that hearts and lives would be changed, and that we would see ourselves as great participants in your great work through all of human history. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. morning in our pastoral prayer, we're going to be praying for a ministry called Harvest USA. Uh, Harvest USA has been a ministry that our church has supported for a number of years, and it began as a ministry of 10th Presbyterian Church, a church in our denomination in Center City, Philadelphia, in 1983, so 40 years ago this year. And they began by ministering to AIDS patients at a time when that disease was affecting many men in the community where the church was located. And over the years, it began in that small way and spread out and is now a nationwide ministry that brings, in their words, truth and mercy, the truth and mercy of Jesus Christ to individuals and families affected by sexual struggles by providing them resources to address biblical sexuality in the lives of individuals and in churches. And Calvary has been a longtime supporter of that ministry, and so I want to pray for them this morning. So let's bow together and come before God and pray. Father, we thank you for 40 years of faithful ministry uh, from Harvest USA. We thank you for their heart that desires to reach into the lives of those whom the world often does not want to talk to. We may like to talk about, but not to and with and go into the depths of people's struggles. And so we pray for the leaders of Harvest USA. We pray for their founder, John Freeman. We thank you for the vision that you gave him 40 years ago and the sustaining power that you have shown to him as he continues to, even today to be active in the ministry of Harvest. We thank you for their president, Mark Sanders, and for all of the others uh, underneath of him who do ministry in the lives of people. Give them wisdom, Lord, in decisions. Give them grace and truth as they speak your word. Give them a personal faith and encouragement and integrity as they go about their work. Lord, we do pray for those who are struggling, <clears throat> those who struggle with sexual uh, sins of all kinds, from same-sex attraction to gender confusion to addictions and behaviors that harm the body and harm the soul for families and parents and spouses struggling to care for those who are trapped by these things. We pray for the materials and the resources of Harvest, that they would be a benefit to many, that their support groups would 
change lives, that churches would be equipped to care for its members, and that you would provide the donors and the volunteers that can support the staff and support the production of resources that are so needed in today's world. And Lord, now we pray for the study of your word. Lord, it is the basis of ministries like Harvest USA, the word that you have given to your people, the truth of all eternity spoken from your lips and given to your people so that we might know who you are and what you have done and who we are and what we have done and what you have done to bring our sinful rebellion to a place of healing and forgiveness through the work of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word and for what it speaks to us. We pray that as we study it this morning, you would be honored as uh, we pay attention to its reading and its teaching, that you would be at work in each of our hearts, that you would change our hearts. Lord, for those who have followed you for years, Lord, let there be conviction where appropriate. Let there be encouragement where it is needed. For those, Lord, who may not know you or may be trying to figure out what all of this uh, means and what life is all about, Lord, may you, through your Holy Spirit, speak in a way that I cannot to apply this word to people's hearts, to bring change, to bring reconciliation and healing. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our scripture reading this morning is from Micah chapter 3. Micah is the sixth book of 12 books at the back of the Old Testament known as the as the minor prophets. So it's at the very end of the Old Testament, there's these 12 minor prophets. Not minor because they're insignificant, minor because the books are relatively short. And we've been studying the book of Micah this summer, tackling a chapter a week. And so we come to chapter 3, and if you were here with us last week, then you know that chapter 2 ends with this image of a divine rescuer, a a, a breaker, one who breaks out against the abusers and the bullies that are harming God's people. You're left with this image of a leader who you can trust and who you can follow. Now, in chapter 3, Micah circles back and he gives us a little bit more detail about the leaders who who were in Jerusalem and Judah at the time. And we see an unfortunate but a very stark contrast to the leader that leads his people, the Messiah, that's talked about at the end of chapter 2. We see these untrustworthy, abusive, and corrupt unjust rulers and leaders in chapter 3. So let me invite you to, uh, to stand as I read this. I'm going to read all of Micah chapter 3, the 12 verses of Micah 3. And then when I'm finished, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. Micah chapter 3. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off of my people and their flesh from off of their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron, then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray. Who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you, without vision, and darkness to you, without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God." But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. This is the word of the Lord. Sometimes birds fly into the window. That's what that was. When it happens to your office window, it's especially kind of startling, and then the 
bird most of the time will kind of hit the ground, shake it off, and then fly away. But um, Micah chapter 3. Let me start with a, a, a story. A young pastor moved to a small American town in the 1970s to take responsibility for his first church, and in that church was a young woman who had recently come to follow Jesus. She was a beautiful young woman from a lower working class neighborhood in the town, and she had gotten wrapped up um, in her life uh, in a criminal gang that had threatened violence against her if she tried to leave now that she was following Jesus. And so the pastor tried to, to help. He showed her that, uh, uh, that what she was doing was wrong, but that really wasn't um, an issue for her. She knew that. She wanted to get out. She didn't need so much convincing uh, that the lifestyle was a bad lifestyle. Her problem was that she was afraid of those who were, who were threatening her. So the pastor tried to, you know, set up a system of accountability. So, okay, this is what you need to say. This is how you need to go about the situation. You know, these are some people you, should kind of, you can kind of go to talk to if you feel a, afraid, maybe some places where she could stay if she felt like she was in danger. And then the pastor went away on vacation and returned only to discover that she had gone back to her old lifestyle in this gang. And he immediately went and found her, and he was somewhat, somewhat frustrated in a way, and he said, what happened? And she said, well, they told me that they would hurt me if I didn't do what they wanted. And the pastor said, but why didn't you do something? And she said, but I, because I was afraid. And she said, well, why? he said, why didn't you go to the police? And he said, you don't understand. They are the police. Now, this is not a statement about all police at all. It's not an anti-law enforcement kind of statement. In fact, the shock that it brings to each of us is because we know the safety that should be provided, the safety that most of the time, most all the time, is provided by those who are in positions of authority. But for us, it highlights the sense of absolute powerlessness and vulnerability that someone must feel when the people who are supposed to be responsible for your care and protection are instead the ones who are doing you harm. And what we just read from Micah chapter 3, that's exactly what we see. A little bit more specific description of the injustice that's happening in the nation of Judah because here Micah begins to call out some of the offices that are committing these acts of injustice that we were reading about in chapter 2. And there's three main sections to the chapter that we kind of read through. You can see them fairly easily if you look at the text. The first one is from verses 1 to 4. The second is from verses 5 to 7. And the last one is from verses 9 to 12. They're sometimes referred to as oracles, three statements or little mini sermons of judgment. And they're all slightly different in their address. But in each of the sections... Micah is doing similar things. He's identifying leaders who are committing injustice. He's describing what they're doing, sometimes in graphic language, and then he promises to do something about it, or promises really that God will do something about it. And so I actually don't want to look at it section by section as much as under four topical headings, the headings that are printed for you in the, in the bulletin. I want to look at first the perpetrators of injustice. In other words, in each of these three sections, who is it that is, that is doing these things? And second, I want to look at the acts of injustice. What are they doing? And third, the consequences of injustice. That is, what is the justice and the discipline that God intends to bring associated with the crime that they're committing? And finally, we can't ignore it because it's even here in this text, the deliverer from injustice, where we can truly go when we need remedy for injustice. So the perpetrators, the acts, the consequences, and ultimately the deliverer. Now, first, the perpetrators. Here in America, we have three branches of, of government. It wasn't exactly the same in ancient Israel, but there were, as we talked about in our Confession of Faith, three offices uh, that were often referred to, uh, three offices of authority in the, in the, among the people of Israel. There were the, there were the judges or the rulers, uh, there were the prophets, and there were the the priests. And God sat over them all, of course. He was the, he was the supreme legislator who had given his law to the, to the people. But these offices operated under, under him. Now, let's think about each of them. These are the ones, each of these offices, these are, the, these are the ones that are highlighted here in Micah 3 as the ones who are committing injustice, perpetrating injustice. So let's look at each of them. Now, start first with the, with the rulers or the judges. That's who's specifically highlighted in the first section. 
Now, I'm not speak, when I say judges, I'm not speaking exclusively of like judges as in the book of Judges. You may have heard, you know, heard or read the book of Judges in the, in the Bible. There's some overlap there in the function that they had, but I'm speaking more generally here, and I'm speaking actually of, a, of an office or a role that began way back, right after the people left the, 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 their slavery in Egypt. And, and, and it happened like this. From the very beginning, there were disputes. After they came out, the Israelites had disputes among themselves. Gather any people of together, and you're going to get disputes. And you may remember that Moses, in the beginning, was trying to settle all of these disputes himself. He was trying to be the judge for every dispute. And, and it was killing him, and it was too much for one person. You can read about it in Exodus 18. And so what they did was they set up a system of, of local judges, right? little chiefs or small groups of of people who would settle, settle the smaller disputes. Now, I'm sure it evolved and had evolved a bit since Moses' time, but the idea is exactly the same by the time of Micah, and that's who he's primarily addressing in the first section of, of Micah 3, right? Look at verse 1. He says, Here, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. He's talking to the administrative rulers, those who had administrative authority to apply the law in, in, in ancient Israel, the local magistrates, the civil authorities, all under, in Micah's day, by the time Micah was ministering, they had, a, they had a king. It was all under the office and the authority of the king. These are the rulers. And their job, it says at the end of verse 1, was to know justice. Now, this is more than just like, you know, having read a book, all right? This is, this is more than just head knowledge. This is the Hebrew concept of knowing, which is not just knowing about something, but knowing it in an intimate way so that it becomes one with you, loving it. Right? They were not just to know the law, they were to love the law and to see that it was loved and followed by, by God's people. And their job was to apply that law that they loved and they owned and they were one with fairly and justly among the people. That's the first office, the office of judge or the office of king or ruler. Now the second office, who Micah addresses in the second section of Micah 3, are the prophets. Look at verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets. Now, the job of the prophet was to declare the law of God, right? Less in, like, less, less in a civil and administrative way, more like a, uh, like a preacher, right? It was to keep the law in front of the people, right? To use some of the language of Micah 3, the prophets who were the ones who saw God clearly and who cried out, who declared the truth about, them, about God. At least that's what they were supposed to do. That was their job, to speak truth about God, to identify areas of sin, and to call the people to be reconciled to God. Now, reconciliation, the specific, the specific office of reconciliation is not actually the office of the prophet. He was to call them to be reconciled to God, to repent of their sins, but the specific, specific office of reconciliation was the office of a priest. Now, this office isn't, isn't the only one that's highlighted in the, the, the third section in verses 9 to 12, but it is included in the list with the others that kind of makes, makes it complete, right? Look at verse 11, where Micah kind of summarizes each of these three offices, and he mentions them one by one. He says, its heads give judgment for a bribe. That's the judges, the rulers, the, uh, the, the, the kingly office. Right? And then at the end of verse 11, its prophets practice divination for money, the prophets, the preachers of God. And then sandwiched in between them, it says, its priests teach for a price. See, they're all doing the same thing. This is kind of the poetry, right? The heads, the rulers, they give judgment for a bribe. The prophets practice divination for money. The, the priests teach for a price. In each case, all three of these offices are named. They are the perpetrators of of injustice. They are the ones who are abandoning their assigned responsibilities for personal gain. That's point number one. Now, second heading, how were they doing it? Right? That's point number two, the acts of injustice. Now, this is where it gets a little bit graphic, a little bit gross, actually. Gotta love the, the sarcasm, the imagery of, of Hebrew poetry. Look at this, verses two and three. Micah highlights the acts of the rulers, and he says, and this is, he's describing like cannibalism here, they tear the skin off my people. Now, he's being metaphorical. He's not actually speaking of this physically happening, right? But th this is what it was like. It's as if, he says, they tear the skin off my people and their flesh off their bones, and they eat their flesh. They break up their bones and they chop them like meat in a pot. Now, that's gross, right? That's cannibalism, right? People eating other people. And it's a picture, a graphic picture of the violence that's being committed by the leaders here. They were supposed to be servants, Right? The, rule, the, the, the rulers, the ones in civil authority, serve and protect, right? 
should have been painted on the side of their cars. That's what they were supposed to be, the helpers of people. Instead, instead of helping the people, they were helping themselves. Instead of feeding the people, they were, in the, in the language of the metaphor, feeding on the people. And we see the parallels today, right? How many times do you see the news where public servants at all levels of government get rich by taking advantages of the offices that they hold? Now, again, this is not in any means to slander everyone who holds public office because all of the good and noble people who are serving in those professions, they don't make the headlines. But you do see the headlines, right, from, from local offices to national news, right? You can read the examples. Now, it's not just the judges and the rulers, though. The prophets also get called out in their section for the things that they're doing. Look at verse 5. Again, with biting irony here, Micah uses. And we have to look at it a little bit more closely to see it, but it's fun to find these things. Verse 5 says the prophets cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Now, you see the contrast in what they're doing, right? On the surface, it seems like they're, like they're preaching with their words a sermon of peace, right? A sermon of peace, sermon of kindness. But in reality, as soon as they don't get what they want, as soon as they're not fed, right, when no one pre- feeds them, they preach with their actions now a sermon of war. They shift when they don't get what they want. When the false prophets are not fed by the people, they turn on the people. Now, we're not talking about appropriate compensation for religious leaders. The Old Testament made provision for that, right, for those who served in offices of religious authority. It was appropriate for the people to compensate those who were in full-time vocational work for, um, for, for ministry. Now, the New Testament also approves of it, does the same thing, but it seems like what's happening here is the prophets, they've got like a little agreement with the people, and it kind of goes like this, even if it's unspoken. It says, I'll preach the happy messages to you, and I'll tell you what you want to hear, and in return, if I don't challenge you or make you really uncomfortable, then you'll pay for my lavish lifestyle, and all will be, all will be good. Now, when that doesn't happen... When the prophets aren't fed by the people, they turn around and they bite the people. That's where some of the the irony is here. Because in this phrase, when they have something to eat, right? At the the beginning, it's literally speaking of the prophets biting with their teeth. It's kind of the same Hebrew idiom that can be used. To bite with your teeth is to have something to eat. And so it has a double meaning, which is ironic because when that phrase, to bite with their teeth, is used in the Old Testament, over ten times it's used, it's talking about a serpent biting someone. All right, so what we have here is it's something that's going beyond indifference to the weak, and it's talking about intentional violence committed against them. Right? This is what happens when the abuser has power and influence and says to the victim, who has neither power nor influence, says to them, if you tell anyone what happened, I'll ruin you. I'll destroy you. I'll destroy your reputation. You'll never be able to work in this company again. You'll never work in this town again. Right? For example, right, this, the, the story of the now disgraced Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein is fairly well known. But, but why did it take so long to, to come out? Right? Why did so many young women who were victims of his abuse in the motion picture industry, why did so many for so many years say nothing? Why did so many others who knew about his behavior, why did they do nothing for years? Because the threat was pretty clear. Weinstein was successful. He was powerful, and he held the keys of career success or failure. And if you did not feed him, his bite was like the bite of a serpent. Now, the unjust leaders, they weren't just acting with passive indifference. No, they were, they were actively exploiting their victims. And you see that image again in verses 9, 10, and 11 in the third section. It says they detest justice. Now here in the third section, of course, we're talking about all three offices, prophet, priest, king. They detest justice. They make crooked. They take what is straight and they bend it for their own personal gain, right? That trading favorable treatment for a bribe, a price for money. That's what verse 11 was saying building their own reputations with blood and with iniquity. That's what it says in in verse 10. But you also see in this third section, in verse 11 specifically, you see the consequences of bad theology. Because it says at the end of verse 11 that the leaders, the prophets, the priests, the, uh, the, the, the rulers, that they lean on the Lord and they say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Now, that's ironic, right? Because this, this leaning on the Lord that they're doing here, is not the, it's, not, it's not the leaning of faith, the leaning of trust, the leaning of submission in the Lord. It's, it's a leaning of presumption that because of their role, because of their position, because I'm a, 
I'm a member of, of God's people after all. Because of that, their, their presumption is that the Lord wouldn't possibly bring judgment and discipline upon them. We're untouchable, they're saying. Now, here's where we need to stop just a minute and be a little bit careful. We need to insert a little interlude here into these, uh, into these four points because it's going to be tempting, maybe already tempting. I'm warning you now it's going to get even more tempting when we get to judgment to, 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 to look at what's going on here as God judges these leaders for what they're doing. It's tempting to step back and shake our heads and say, those bad people, yeah, they deserve what they get. It's a shame, but they deserve what's coming to them. And as we do that, try to exclude ourselves from the perpetrators of injustice. So let me just be a good prophet here for a second and, and apply this a little to all of us. If you go back to chapter 2, I didn't have time to talk about this last week, but if you go back to chapter 2, where we were in, 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 in verse 2 of chapter 2, it's very interesting to note that when Micah is talking about the abusive and the unjust behavior of those in authority, he traces it back to covetousness. Look at verse 2 in chapter 2. It says, they covet fields and they seize them, right? Their, their, their action, their unjust action was they were, they were taking property from people who could not defend themselves. That was the unjust action. But it starts, he says, with them coveting the fields before they take them. It's a sin of covetousness. Now, the prohibition against coveting, of course, is the 10th commandment. Coveting is to want something you don't have that belongs to another person ultimately because you don't trust God to adequately provide for yourself. And this is interesting because the sin, the root of the sin of the unjust leader, the bully, the abuser, the root of the sin here, then, Micah is saying, is one of the heart, not primarily the external action. The external action is what happens when someone who, who becomes a bully has the, has the power to do something about their covetousness, but the root sin is the covetousness itself. One of the commentators, Dale Ralph, Dave, Dale Ralph Davis, says it like this. He says, the fact that you've done nothing like the thugs in this text does not mean that you are virtuous, but only that you may lack opportunity to sin in this way. With that verb, covet, the Lord opens up the septic tank of your own reeking nature and lets you smell it. See, what he's saying is it's far too easy for us when we come across cases of gross injustice to say, yeah, well, I'm not taking advantage of the poor and the powerless people. I'm not feeding on the weak and the, and the marginalized. Well, maybe not. Hopefully not. But what the 10th commandment does is help us to see that all of our root rebellious desires, all of us, they're all the same. Even if our particular expression of them happens on a much smaller stage. In other words, what Dale Ralph Davis is saying is that you might just lack the opportunity. <laughs> you might be the same sinner at heart. You might just lack the opportunity of someone who has power, right? You might not have a lot of power, right? You can't extort millions of dollars in bribes for a, from a government contract, right? Maybe, maybe you're just, I don't know, maybe you're just the parent in your home who has the ability to take the last piece of cake, right, between meals because your kid's you know, the one that your kids really wanted, but you can take it because, well, after all, you're the parent, right? You, you have the power to take it. You can justify it by saying something like, well, they would have just fought about it anyway, so we're not going to divide it up. I'll eat it myself. Why? Because you have the power. Now, that's just little, right? Right? It, but the exact same sin is at the, is at the root of the unjust leader. It's, your sin is just, your sin isn't smaller. Your opportunity is just smaller, now, just so I'm clear here, right, if you've been someone who has suffered at the hand of injustice, that doesn't mean that you're to blame for what happened. It doesn't mean that you're equally blame, uh, blameworthy for abuse that's happened against you, right? That may have been even, in fact, what the bully or the abuser or the, the unjust leader, that may be even what they've told you. It's not your fault when you've been unjustly treated, right? You're not to blame, just like Micah's not blaming the people who are taken advantage of, but it is a reminder here to us, to all of us, that we can't just simply sit back and assume that our heart condition is any better than the injustice of someone with power. Because it doesn't necessarily mean we lack the desire for injustice in our hearts. It just may mean we lack the opportunity. All right, that's the end of the, the interlude. Now let's see where all this leads. Point number three, the consequences of injustice. See, here's the problem with being an arrogant ruler. You're always under a higher authority. If you're an arrogant, unjust human ruler, you're always under the authority of someone else, and that's the case here. Micah is pointing that out. All right, here, here's a historical example. Robert Bruce was a Scottish preacher in the late 1500s, early 1600s, quite prominent in his day, and there were oftentimes a number of prominent people who would attend his services. On one occasion, though, the king, 
Now, King James VI was in his service with his entourage, and while Bruce was preaching, he was rather rudely and repeatedly talking with members of his royal entourage during the sermon. And supposedly, Bruce addressed the king from the pulpit, the king, and said, listen to this, the lion of the tribe of Judah is now roaring in the voice of his gospel, and it becomes all the petty kings of the earth to be silent. Wow, that's bold, right? The lion of the tribe of Judah is now roaring and speaking in his gospel, and it, it becomes all the petty kings of this earth to be silent. That's what Micah's doing here. In each of these oracles in chapter 3, he identifies the perpetrators of injustice, he lists their offenses, and then he commands their silence, not before his own authority, but before God's authority, and he pronounces judgment. Look at verse 4. God will not answer. He will not hide his face. The ruler will cry out to God, he says. This isn't the cry of repentance. This is a cry of distress. Call to God for help. When the ruler finds the tables turned against him, he's going to cry out, but his cries will not be answered. That's the judgment. Similar image in verses 6 and 7, talking about the prophets. Look at the poetic justice here. The ones whose job it was to see, right, that's the job of the prophet, right, will be put into darkness, it says, right? No visibility, no ability to see. Now, again, they'll try to find God when judgment comes on them, but what will they find? No answer, it says. Just silence. And just so you know, this is the greatest of all possible judgments. It is fair. It is just. It fits the crime. But it is terrible. The, the, the French theologian John Calvin, this is what he says in his commentary, Micah confronts us with the greatest evil that could ever befall us. That is that God rejects those who reject Him and that God refuses to answer them so that all their prayers are in vain and are no longer received by God. That's judgment. Now, we don't live in an age where prophets receive direct prophecy like Micah or when God speaks verbally and directly with His people through human prophets, but what this does mean for us, because we have in front of us the words of God, right? What it does mean for us is that there will come a point in the lives of people who continually are unwilling to hear what God is saying in their lives, who continually resist and push against the Word of God. There will come a point when the perfectly just but terrible response of God is His taking away of that desire to hear Him, right? Test yourself here. The ability to hear God better comes with the pursuit of God. The more you pursue Him, the better you hear Him. And on the flip side, the less you pursue Him, the more deaf you will become. The neglect of God's voice ultimately leads to deafening, the loss of the ability to hear. That's the judgment that Micah is talking about here. Now, note the final end where all of this goes, the final judgment where all of this is leading for the leaders of all three of these offices, prophet, priest, king. In in, in Micah chapter 12, all this ends up leading it says, to the destruction of Jerusalem. Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. It means it's going to be grown over. All the symbols of the authority and the structure of, of Judah, it's all going to be brought down. It's going to be cleared away. The rubble is going to be piled up and the former glory is going to be hidden and obscured from view. That's the judgment. To be eternally forgotten, the final and terrible judgment of all who would forget God. But, but there is hope. Last point, the deliverer of injustice. Because we live in an age where this word of God's mercy and grace is still proclaimed, just like it was proclaimed by Micah to the people of of Judah, right? There is a prophet who hasn't surrendered here in Micah 3. Look at him. You see him in verse 8. At the end of his second oracle of judgment, the one against the prophets, this is what Micah says. He makes a contrast, and he says, as for me, in contrast to everyone else. As for me, I am filled with power with the Spirit of the Lord and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. See, Micah is a faithful witness, a faithful witness that remains in Judah even during these dark times. And this verse, verse 8, is a summary of Micah's ministry of who he is, right? He's alone. He says, as for me, contrast, everyone else, as for me, right? He's isolated, seemingly all by himself. He's equipped, though, it's not, his, it's not his strength that he's operating under. It's, he's filled, he says. 
filled, passive voice, by God, with power, with the Spirit, with justice and might, for a task, for a purpose, right? To declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. In other words, he's equipped to be the better prophet. And a better prophet is exactly what we need. But not only that, we need a better priest. We need a better ruler. And Jesus, of course, is all of these things. Jesus, like Micah, stood alone in contrast to the words that everyone else was saying. Right? But he truly stood alone. He went into the wilderness. He was tempted by Satan with bribes to use his power to benefit himself at the expense of the weak, but he resisted. Jesus was equipped just like Micah was, right? The angels ministered to him. The Holy Spirit came upon him. Jesus wasn't equipped out of his weakness, though, but he was equipped. He was equipped for the work that he was doing, for the task that he was given, and that task to proclaim a message of sin and repentance and to ultimately become the sacrifice that was needed for our sin. You see, to each of us, accountability is required for the authority that is given to us. At whatever that level might be, right? You might be a military commander. You might be the senior executive of a a large corporation. You might be the mayor of a city. You might be the president of the United States, and you have authority over dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of people. Or you might just be the director of of a small charity. You might be the coach of a youth sports team. You might be a parent in your own home, and you have authority over just a few Or maybe, and this is all of us now, you have authority over yourself, right? The choices that you have been, the choices that you make, you've been made a steward over your own life, over your own heart, over your own body, and the things that you do with it, the things that you do with that authority and that responsibility is what you will be held accountable for. You still have, all of us, an authority that you can abuse, and you're accountable for the misuse of that authority. Now, thankfully, Those who put their faith in Jesus are trusting in the hope that not only did he never misuse his authority, but he chose to make himself accountable for the abuses that you have committed. In other words, Jesus is never held accountable in judgment for any abuse that he ever committed, but he chose in going to the cross for us to become accountable for each of the abuses, each of the injustices that we commit as we take our authority in our own lives and we misuse it. That's what the cross is. Jesus saying, I will be the perfect user of authority who will bear the accountability for those who have abused theirs. So that their misuse of authority, their transgression and sin, like it talks about in verse 8, so that it can be seen, so that it can be confessed, so that it can be forgiven by the perfect prophet, the perfect priest, and the perfect king. Now, as we conclude, what's our response? How do we respond to this? Well, first, we respond in repentance. Repentance. Right? When, when, when we hear this proclaimed to us, we confess our sin. God will hear the sincere cries of confession and repentance for those who recognize their sin. Right? We know that from verse 12. Verse 12 of Micah 3. Now, not really because of what verse 12 says, but from the other place in the Bible where Micah chapter 3 verse 12 is quoted. The other place where Micah chapter 3 verse 12 shows up in the Bible is in Jeremiah chapter 26. Right? More than a hundred years later, the prophet Jeremiah is facing a group of leaders, corrupt leaders, in the last days of Jerusalem before it fell to Babylon. And some of these leaders wanted to kill Jeremiah because Jeremiah was speaking truth and they didn't like it, and so they wanted to kill him. But a few, a few of the elders stood up and they told everyone there about this guy named Micah who had lived over a hundred years ago. And they said, Quote, Jeremiah 26, Micah of Morsheth, he prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he said to all the people of Judah, and then they quote Micah chapter 3, verse 12, about the judgment that would come upon Jerusalem. And then they remember that King Hezekiah, back in the days of Micah, they remember that they heard the words of Micah, that Hezekiah heard what Micah said, and he repented. And and, and God spared Jerusalem, and he spared Judah in his day. You see that? God will hold those who abuse their authority, whether it's over millions or just over themselves, but he delights in restoring repentant sinners to a relationship with him and sparing them. 
from the justice that they deserve, right? That was Hezekiah. There was a, a king who had not used his authority wisely up to that point, but a king who, when confronted with the truth of God's word, came under God's authority and confessed and repented, saw his sin, saw God, turned to him to forgiveness and restoration, and found it. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what your sin is, if you see it, if you seek forgiveness from God with all your heart, then you will find it when you put your faith in Jesus, the perfect prophet, priest, and king. Now then, last thing, what do we do? What's the, so confess your sin to come into right relationship. And then look at each of your relationships, starting with yourselves and then your families and then anything else over which you have authority and you rely on God for the wisdom and the strength and the Holy Spirit to resist temptation and strengthen you for success. Here's a prayer you can pray. It comes from an ironic kind of place, but this is where I, this is, this is the things I think of. There's this really cool prayer from an old Sean Connery movie. <laughs> Sean Connery movie, First Night. He was King Arthur. Richard Gere was Lancelot. It was an okay movie. But there was this prayer that I've never been able to get out of my head because it's the perfect prayer for those who are in authority. Right? Arthur, King Arthur, Sean Connery, right, begins the council meeting of his knights around the, the round table in this movie with a prayer that, ev- that should be the prayer of every forgiven, humbled leader who is now seeking to lead out of God's strength, right? This is what he prays. He gathers the knights together and he says, God, grant us the wisdom to discover the right, the will to choose it, and the strength to make it endure. You hear that? The wisdom to discover the right, the will to choose it, and the strength to make it endure. That's the prayer of a leader rightly using the authority given to him humbled to know that only God grants clarity to even discover and to know what's right in the first place. And knowing that only God can grant, even when the truth is known, only God can grant the will to resist temptation and to stay on the right path. And the humility to know that only God ultimately can grant the success, even of the wisest of decisions. That's what we're called to do. And we can do it because we follow a God who does it on our behalf, because we follow a king better than Arthur, better than Hezekiah, a king who rules over all, who defends his people, and who leads us to victory. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the goodness that you have shown to us in Jesus Christ, our perfect prophet, priest, and king. Lord, we pray that we would take to heart the message of Micah. Take to heart first as we examine our own hearts and our own lives and we see sin there. Lord, bring us to a state of conviction and then, Lord, to a a place of repentance and confession. And Lord, help us to find the mercy that you offer to those who bring their sin to you. Help us to trust and to rely upon Jesus, to confess our sins to him and to follow him as our king, trusting in his words as a prophet and relying upon his sacrifice as a priest. For we pray in his name. Amen. The day of judgment is known, it is to be feared, but we live in the days of grace where even the arrogant and the proud are invited to come and to receive that grace out of our bondage, out of our sorrow, out of our failure, out of our shame, out of our arrogance, out of our fear, to come out of those things and come to Jesus, to come into the joy and into the light of His presence. Let's stand and let's sing together.
you go, I invite you to go with God's blessing, hear His words to you through 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.